All right, everyone, welcome back to The Contrarians. Today, we're doing a Dark Horse album panel. It's another Patreon voted on album. This time, we have chosen 1975's Come Taste the Band, the only Deep Purple album to feature Tommy Bolin. So let's go around the uh, go around the panel, find out what people think of this album. If you feel like it, give it a rating out of 10. We usually come up with kind of a Contrarian's composite score at the end. And uh, we're just going to have some fun. I'm going to kick it off with Pontus. Pontus, oh. come, come taste the band. Oh, uh, so I'm first out. This is a, a record that, it's one of those records from the mid-70s where you were told by your friends when you, I, I discovered this music in the 80s, right? So you were told by many people to stay away from this because it it didn't have Blackmore, it didn't have Gillen, it was the last uh, of the classic uh, group albums. It just whistled out of, um, and it, it, it just led to an end. Um, but I, actually, through the years, um, I have come to love this album. And I think it's a great, great little album in its own right. It is very, very it's it's far it's 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 a far more heavy album. It's a heavy album than than Stormbringer is. Uh, there's a, lots of good riffs. I think the playing overall is great. Um, I think Coverdale is coming into his own. I mean, if you take a song like The Drifter, you have a ten plate for a White Snake will do a few years later. In fact. I think that it would be interesting to to play the little game of what if. What if Coverdale hadn't listened to Spectrum by Billy Cobham or had listened to <clears throat> Use Lucy by, you know, that band, Use Lucy, which had a guitarist called Mickey Moody in it and <laughs> invited him? We would then have, pur would Purple be Whitesnake? Um, uh, I think the, one, of the leading, uh, one of the great stars of the album is Ian Pace, He's in a very good uh, place here. He he plays enormously well. I think Martin Birch gave the band a great, great sound. Um, the, it's warm, it's rich. You hear every instrument, the bass and drums lock in. Uh, Bowling's guitar playing is great. The problem with Bowling was not his guitar playing. The problem with Bowling was his drug addiction. And, and here, when it comes to the album, he's He's still on a steady form, so he delivers what he's supposed to deliver, a good bunch of songs. Great riffs. There's a lot of funk in here. There's got great stuff. There's a, you know, here's a ten, this is a template for, you know, what you could call, you know, funk rock in a sense. It's, it's a very sort of, it has a groove. It has a enormously good, um, a bunch of songs. I think the the little um, John Lord um, this time around and O to G is an exceptionally good thing. A pairing of those two. One is very one is very soft. Um, where Lord actually plays keyboards, more keyboards than organ, and you have a um, bona fide, you know, um, fusion track at the end. O to G. Um, so I've, I, I generally uh, rate his album as very high, 9.5, usually. Um, I think the Ken Shirley mix um, highlights more soloing than, than the 1975 mix does, but I do think the 1965, 1975 mix stands up very well. So, so um, I love this album. I think it's... You know, getting tighter is great. Uh, that sort of juice bowling uh, song they wrote together, and I think if if it wasn't for the drugs, if it, which was not just bowling, it was juice as well. And I think Lord was in a bad state with alcohol. If 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 the band had stayed together, they could have done more interesting music, I think. And but it wasn't to happen, and um. Bowling suffered from it and died um, a year after this. So, so it's so it's a sad, sad album in a sense. But it's 
as it stands, I think it's a very good 70s album. It's a very American album. It's a, you know, it's, it's Englishmen playing American rock and um, doing it very well. Sweet. Okay, getting us off to a good start. I actually completely agree with that very American album thing. We may talk about that more as we go. All right, let's go over to uh, Richard Reccia. Richard? Yeah. Tell us what you think of Come Taste the Band. Well, um, actually, yesterday was the first time I'd actually played the album all the way through. I was familiar with it over the years. Um, I, I don't think it's a bad album, but it's definitely not one of my favorite Deep Purple albums. Um, I don't like the fact that John Lord isn't isn't involved as much. Um, the songs I like are the ones that he can be heard on, like um, Coming Home and Getting Tighter. I love that song. Um, and uh, Ode to G and You Keep On Moving. Um, I Like I said, I really wish John Lord was more involved in the album. Um, I don't really like the way David Coverdale sounds on it. I actually preferred him fronting White Snake more than I did when he was with Deep, Deep Purple. Um, and the album doesn't feature Glenn Hughes as much. And um, three of my favorite songs are s sung by uh, Glenn Hughes or, or partly sung by him. Um, and that's uh, Getting Tighter, This Time Around, and You Keep On Moving. Um, I, I I see this lineup. Um, to me, Richie Blackmore was really what made me want to really maybe like Deep Purple. And without him, it's kind of like, and this is just my opinion, um, UFO without Michael Schenker. I think Michael Schenker made that group really, really special. And I think Richie Blackmore made Deep Purple special. I've always loved him as a guitar player. And I think he was good at writing songs and good at writing riffs. Um, and yeah, all the albums they did without Richie Blackmore, I don't rank too, I mean, that high. Like of the Steve Morris ones, I think I have three of those albums. That's Perpendicular, um, A Band On, and another one, which I, I can't remember. Um, but yeah, um, so I think I'm going to give this album a six. I think there's some good songs off it, um, but John Lord you know, seems more of like a sideman on this. And he doesn't even get an organ solo in until the last song. So it would have been nice to have a little bit more input from him and maybe a few more vocals from Glenn Hughes. But yeah, I give it a six out of 10. Sweet. Okay, well, that's still technically a positive score. Very good, thank you. Let's go down to Tate. Tate, tell us what you think of Come Taste the Band. Well, I'll tell you what I think about Come Taste the Band in the fact that I love this album. It's probably in my top three favorite Deep Purple albums because Burn and Stormbringer are, well, Stormbringer I think is my favorite Deep Purple album and um, Burn probably is in that conversation too. It kind of flip-flops between them. But to me, uh, Stormbringer is just a continuation on of what the band was doing on i'm sorry come taste the band is a uh um basically a continuation of what the band was doing on stormbringer and the fact that uh the funk and soul are probably more realized here uh than on um stormbringer because stormbringer for me is a little bit heavier than some of the stuff you get on this album because Blackmore was still kind of fighting the band for, uh, you know, musical and creative control, um, which resulted in him leaving the band to form Rainbow uh, after the tour. And, uh, you know, they bought Bolin in and Bolin, I think, obviously is a is a completely different guitar player to Blackmore. And I think he, he serves some material on here on here really well. So with that being said, I'll go into the track listing real quick. So it opens up with coming home. Holy crap. Is this heavy? Just put the needle on and then man, the song could have been on burn. I think um, that would have fit really well on burn. Uh, David's David Coverdale's vocals on here are great. And Bolin comes in with the solo that uh, could make the listener think, Hey, you know what? He ain't black more, but he's, 
pretty damn good. And I think that this song would have also fit on uh, Uriah Heep's Wonderworld album, too, because it kind of reminds me a little bit of that song, So Tired, in that album. Continuing on with Lady Luck, very funky tune that reminds me that could have fit well on Stormbringer and uh, very representative of the, the direction that uh, David Coverdale and Glenn Hughes wanted to go in, and Glenn Hughes' bass is, is featured very predominantly on the song. Getting Tighter, which is probably a, a one of the huge highlights on this album. Um, you know, great vocals from Glenn Hughes on this album. The band is very tight. Uh, you know, the, the B section kind of reminds me of something from, like, Parliament Funkadelic, and Ian Pace puts on a clinic here with... Uh, with um, his drum performance i mean pace is just an amazing drummer as it is so he you know never disappoints but in this tune he stands out a lot um dealer again another kind of maybe a little bit of a doomy uh funky rocker that could have fit really well on stormbringer as well as the first moxie album um you know a lot of uh, a lot of people don't really talk about the first moxie album when it comes to, to tommy bolin but uh he actually played a good portion of the guitar solos on on that album and i think that dealer is kind of representative of that and uh um, a great kind of uh, light and shade with the song with a, a really cool um drum performance by um ian pace on this um i, I need love again could have fit really well on stormbringer um great riff to it great breakdown section as, as well not much to say on that one Drifter, um, Pace's drumming on this tune reminds me a lot of Richie Hayward from uh, Little Feed, uh, particularly on the song uh, Dixie Chicken. Uh, and, and again, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that it could have fit on Stormbringer. A uh, great solo from from Boland and John Lord's uh, uh, keyboards are great, and it's got a really chaotic chaotic outro section. Unlike um, what was said previously, the fact that John Lord isn't as prominent on this album doesn't really bother me all that much. I think uh, he definitely works really well in the background, um, so that doesn't really bother me all that much. Uh, and then following that, we have the very Zeppelin-y Love Child that could have fit very well on uh, Led Zeppelin 2. It also could have fit on the first Moxie album, Moxie 2, or can you probably guess what album? Stormbreaker. <laughs> but um, Coverdale sings really great on it, and it's got um, some really good uh, keyboards from John Lord as well. And then for me, another really highlight, a uh, huge highlight of the album is the This Time Around in ODG. It's a really uh, kind of mellow song in the beginning that provides a good break from all the funky hard rock that we're getting that was delivered to us before um glenn sings great on it and it sinks into a great instrumental from uh tommy bullen that could have fit really well on one of his solo albums as well as like uh um, banger miami from the james gang and then it finishes with uh you keep on moving um starts kind of balladish but eventually builds up with a great mm -hmm. keyboard solo from from john lord his uh one real feature on this album and it's got uh Great harmonies from from Coverdale and Hughes and uh, um, great Ian Pace writes them well. And I just want to say that, um, like, uh, like what was mentioned before, um, I, the the problem with this that a lot of people perceived wasn't that Bolin wasn't great, or at least that I think Bolin wasn't. Bolin was a great fit for this material and this sort of style of music. Like, I think he fits right in with the direction that Coverdale and um, Byrne wanted to go to. The problem with Bolin was that his his heroin addiction and the fact that he couldn't play the Blackmore stuff very well. Because if you see some of the, the footage of uh, the Come Taste of the Band tour and they're playing Byrne, um, poor John Lord has to do double duty because... From what I can see, Bolin is just up there strumming and he's just looking lost up there, staring off into space. I think that's probably the heroin taking taking over from him. And it's just it's it's sad to see that um such a such a huge talent would um would be gone uh not long after this album was released and the tour was done and um uh he would be he would be found dead i think in a miami hotel room at age i think it was 25. um but so rest in peace to tommy bowl and and um as is like one of the last albums that he put out i mean i mean this is this is great so for me come taste the band even though it may not be like my absolute favorite deep purple album i i'd be remiss if i get if i gave it less than a 10 out of 10. it's it's terrific 
Um, nice. So. Okay, ten out of ten. Well, we'll see. Wow. Uh, we'll see if the other panel supports that or not. Well, yeah, nine and a half from Pontus. All right, Martin, you're next up on the roster. Tell us what you think about "Come Taste the Band." All right, so I uh, so my general impression of this album is that it's a a louder across the board, busier, more action packed arrangements version of Stormbringer. Uh, it is on its way uh, to David Coverdale's Snake Snake Bite and North Winds, and then into Trouble. A lot of it sounds like that. Um, yeah, I I think the production sounds really good for 1975. It's bright. It's 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 full spectrum enough. It might be missing a little bit on the bass end, um, but yeah, it it feels like it feels like a compromise uh, position between Burn and Stormbringer. And then, uh, as you guys have so eloquently brought up, you know, the Tommy situation makes it sound American, and it's very much like uh, you know um, who mentioned uh, Michael Schenker? Was that you, Richard? Yeah, that was me. Yeah. yeah. So I was going to mention Vinnie Moore because basically, yeah, the, the difference here is that you're losing somebody with a, with a European personality and you're just replacing him with someone with no personality. It's just a generalist American rocking. He He's obviously fine with the David Coverdale, Glenn Hughes funk direction. Comes from a fusion background, but you listen to uh, Private Eyes and, and Teaser, same kind of thing, right? Uh, it just feels like He's comfortable with this kind of material, and and frankly, I guess I guess a lot of it came from him as well. Um, but yeah, you're you're missing all of that uh, that personality that Richie brought, and I and I'm a big booster of the Steve Morse stuff as well, and I like Simon McBride, so I I'm I'm not I'm not uh, saying that uh, it's only Richie basically kind of thing. I I um I just think yeah, you're just getting a generalist here. Um, just go through the tracks quickly. Coming home to me is like this album's no surprise from Night in the Ruts, um, and I like the um comparison to So Tired. It's uh it's an up tempo song. David Coverdale said. Uh, you know, he was exaggerating, but he said, oh, I gave him uh, another million miles an hour song like uh, like Stormbringer or Lady Double Dealer. And it's not that it's not that, uh, you know, purely heavy metal. It's just kind of a picked up song. Lady Lock, heavy funk again, White Snake, North Winds, Snake Bite. Getting Tighter is a highlight. Uh, you know, Glenn singing. Um, it's got a slight heaviness to the chorus. Uh, dealer I don't like very much slow sort of glumping old sounding reminds me a little bit of like a demon's eye circular kind of bluesy riff I need love not not much of a fan of that that either mid pace pop R&B ballad kind of thing uh, you know and I hate those songs where where a drummer hits a tom tom instead of the snare drum right doom doom and it's one of those right um, the drifter I really like I think that's a good quality white snake song by the way I think David Coverdale sings great on this album I love David's I love David's songs I think more than Glenn's songs and I, I I'm like I, you know appreciate him singing more uh love child I think is the absolute highlight although I really like coming home as well uh it's only David singing the heaviest one and my favorite part of the whole album is the verses of this one you know with that with that mono monotonic da 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 -da 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 -da. you know slow super heavy i think it's a really creative riff and it's the only thing really on here that doesn't go in a funk r&b kind of direction it's it's really the only purely heavy metal part of the whole album uh this time around ode to g yeah you know uh uh experimental enough it's kind of cool two weird titles stuck together soul ballad and a fusion song you keep on moving not a big not a big fan of that either but it's okay dark bluesy ballad organ uh yeah there's not a lot of straight you know, like crazy hammond on here on the here but there's a lot of keyboards clavinet regular organ sort of stuff so yeah it's uh it's a pretty good album I, I think you know generally speaking i've always liked it a little more than stormbringer and a fair lot less than burn i'm gonna give it a seven out of ten Okay, sorry, I had to unmute there. Seven out of ten, not bad. I kind of want your your uh, <laughs> review there. I thought it could have gone either way. Yeah, <laughs> but seven will take it. All right, Tim, tell us what you think of "Come Taste the Band." Yeah, um, so like uh, Pontus said, this is one of those albums because I, 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 being my age, I got into White Snake first, and then kind of went back into the older White Snake, and eventually that led down the Purple Path. And this was always one of those albums, like uh, Martin already mentioned, Night in the Ruts, but especially Rock in a Hard Place, where just by the fact that you've got, you know, you don't have a classic member there that you're, quote-unquote, not supposed to like this album. Um, and 
I've always liked those albums that you're not supposed to like. So I don't, I didn't have any preconceptions. Um, but because Deep Purple have so many albums, I was just kind of getting them piecemeal here and there. And believe it or not, uh, our, our good friend uh, Peter Kerr from Rock Daydream Nation will cringe when he hears this, but it wasn't until uh, David Coverdale put out the Purple album in 2015 where, you know, Whitesnake re-recording a bunch of songs from his three Deep Purple albums. I realized that, oh, I've only got Burn. I don't have Stormbringer or Come Taste the Band, so I, I've got to I've got to rectify that problem. Um, never mind the slightly disturbing album uh, title and, and, and accompanying photo. Uh, and it comes from, from this Cabaret, album, Tim. Tim, I think I think I should have mentioned that. I think it comes from Come Taste the Wine, Come Taste the. You know, it's. Uh, I think it's from the musical Cabaret or something. Yeah. Oh, well, yes, it, and it's yeah. very British sounding. But of course, given that it's like you can almost see Coverdale smirking here, right? <laughs> so it's like a precursor to Come and Get It. But anyway, um, so on the Purple album, uh, the regular 13-track album, there's only um, You Keep On Moving and uh, Love Child. But if you got the bonus version, you get Lady Luck and Coming Home. And I really, it, I've never heard any of those songs, and I really like all of those on the Purple album, especially Coming Home. They turned that into this... Uh, sort of anthemic white snake type song with almost like thin Lizzie twin lead guitars. And I was actually kind of disappointed when I heard the version on come taste the band. I thought that the chorus, the background vocals were kind of weird. We come in. Like it's got that weird kind of <laughs> hi ho, hi ho thing happening, but it's great. I do love the, the, the original and, and Bolin is just, you know, he's on fire on this album. Love child is like a template for white snake in any era like the the purple album version that could have almost passed as a brand new song and i wouldn't necessarily have known it was a deep purple remake that just sounds like something coverdale would have written uh i'm i'm not the biggest glenn hughes fan so i like the fact that coverdale sings the majority of this album having said that i think getting tighter is a fantastic song because glenn's one of those guys with his vocals sometimes i think he kind of dare I say overdoes it and he just kind of keeps it keeps it really really focused on getting tighter really like that one I think this time around is great his singing is great on that so no disrespect there but yeah drifter is never mind the fact that it's got the word drifter you know like a drifter I was born to walk alone uh drifter just sounds like an early white snake song to me a lot of this yeah. album makes me wonder if deep purple had stayed together in this lineup would we eventually have gotten something like Ready and Willing with the Deep Purple name on it instead of White Snake? Because it's heading in that direction. This was different than Burn, different than Stormbringer. It was really its own thing. Uh, and it's odd that, you know, here you have this quintessentially British band with an American guitar player. Well, who would do that years later but White Snake? Uh, but this is a great album. I don't, I don't think it's deserving of its bad reputation. I was just checking... RIAA it hasn't certified which is a shame I think it peaked at 43 when it first came out and it it went out of print it was one of those you know Warner didn't keep it in regular rotation for some reason um, I pretty much like the entire album uh, I'm gonna say if anybody's interested in this period if you haven't checked it out the Phoenix Rising uh, which came out in 2011 it's a CD DVD package and it's focuses on this era um, but anyway, as as for my rating of Come Taste the Band, you know, it's not one of my favorite Deep Purple albums, but I really like it. I think I'm going to give it a 7.5. Sweet. Nice. Man, all right. People are loving on this album, on the Contrarians. I guess we have a reputation to maintain. Uh, Butch, you're up. What do you think about Come Taste the Band? Are you positive? Everyone's positive so far. Well, I mean, just, just spoiler alert, I'm a big Tommy Bolin and Glenn Hughes fan, and uh, so um, we'll get to the, the rating later. But uh, actually, this is one of those records, too, like a, a lot of the rest of you that uh, I came to later. Um, and uh, I actually got to this record through the Tommy Bolin box set that they put out called The Ultimate. Um, I hadn't heard, you know, this is one of those albums that I would – 
you know, see, I would see in used record stores and I didn't think much of it. Some people said, you know, it's not, it, it's the old, it's not deep purple, no Richie, no deep purple kind of thing, whatever. Um, but I got the ultimate box set. I, I knew a little bit of Bolin stuff and I really liked his playing. So I bought the box set when it came out. And um, when I heard uh, getting tighter on there, that um, blew me through the wall. Like I love that song. I mean, I'm, I'm um, I got to be uh, in my later teen years. I, I came to funk through Sly and the Family Stone, watch, seeing the Woodstock movie. So the, the melding of the two, like funk into like this hard rock thing that was going on in that song i was like amazed by it in addition to all the other material on that box set was from the james gang stuff to the um to the solo things to the the, the stuff from spectrum and mind transplant i mean tommy's playing is insanely good um i think he had a unique sound and style too um that was different from what a lot of other people were doing um, so I, you know, as soon as I heard that, I had to go and get this record. And then luckily, I don't think not too long after Metal Blade was doing those reissues of like, you know, they put out the Stars records and they did the Co Alice Cooper and Come Taste the Band was one of the ones. So I bought it right away. And uh, man, I really like this record. I, when, I, when I first put it on, I heard like, I love coming home right away. I like the energy to it. It's kind of up-tempo and fast. I, I'm, I'm interested now. I didn't hear the the remade version of it on the that purple that expanded edition so i got to hear that now to to compare the two but uh coming home is great it's still one of my favorite songs on this record i love the energy on it lady luck is awesome and then of course getting tighter which is one of my not only like one of my favorite songs from this record but one of my favorite deep purple songs and one of my favorite songs of all time uh i saw glenn last year i just saw him tuesday night and he plays it always, um, always introduces it, you know, saying that it's for Tommy and it's, uh, it's an amazing song. I'm, you know, any performance I've heard of it is tremendous. Um, Dealer's pretty cool. I need love. Those are, I don't know. I mean, I really like those songs, but they're, they're kind of like, they're not the high points. Like for me, that getting tighter and coming home were, um, this time around at Ode to G, I think is really cool and different. For them and then you keep on moving uh i love that song that's uh i don't know that gets me in the in the feels kind of so to as the as they say i mean uh to hear that live when glenn was doing this tour um playing the the deep purple material like it just uh there's just something about that song that it's kind of like to me it's like a I don't know. It's a more emotional version of mistreated really, which I love. Um, and honestly, the, the older I get, I think I like this song more than I like mistreated, which I think is great. But, uh, I don't know. Overall, I really love this record. I mean, it's, it's, it's different, but I still think it sounds like, I mean, I still think it sounds like deep purple. There's a, a, a lot of the riffing and stuff wouldn't be out of place on the other, the, the album of Blackmore. It's just a difference in the, the guitar styles really you know blackmore's got that more like martin was saying and you know other folks have said it, he's got that more european kind of classical vibe going on whereas tommy is like definitely leaning towards uh you know he's definitely got the is an americanized um player um i think though like i think it would be interesting if the band had stayed together but honestly obviously that would have been contingent upon boland staying alive in a lot of ways and uh you know uh hughes keeping it together you know had they managed to keep their shit together and had boland lived and had the band stayed together i honestly don't know how long the lineup would have lasted anyway because boland's playing i think like was like so like just the the rate that it was improving i mean he was doing he played some crazy if you listen to spectrum and that alphonse mouse on mind transplant like it's mm -hmm. Un it warps your mind like what Bolin is doing and I think he would have ended up had he lived like would have ended up on his own anyway um, it's nice to think about though what I would have liked to have seen what this band could have done together because I love Coverdale's voice I love him and Glenn singing together and I love the you know Bolin on here I love his writing um, I love his playing uh, 
it's a tight record, man. I mean, I I go back to this probably more than a lot of the other ones when it comes time to play Purple, and I probably rate it like I don't know. It's probably my third favorite Deep Purple record. I I like it more than most of the Gillen ones. Uh, I'd put it after uh, In Rock for sure, and maybe maybe after Burn. So it's either two or three for me. I I give the record uh, I don't know nine and a half. There's a couple songs that I don't like think are totally over the top great but are still like they're not there's no skippers on here for me but i think overall nine and a half is fair for this and i think its reputation is like a record you should avoid is that's not one i uh i subscribe to and i think it's uh i don't know it's you know maybe because i came into it later like i didn't have the baggage of being a deep purple fan when they were putting out the records with Blackmore. Everything was, you know, I started getting into music in the 80s. So everything to me was going backwards. So to me, it's like not, it wasn't a big, it wasn't like hurt to my soul that Blackmore is not on this record, you know, like a lot of fans would have been then. So not and a half, getting tighter. You keep on moving to the highlights for me. Okay, nine and a half. Well, I think it's fair to say the panel is very positive on this album. Now, I swear to God, everyone, I do not plan this in advance, but I'm going to take the opposite view. I hate this album. Uh, and context is everything. Let me just say first, time heals all wounds. So we are almost 50 years after this album came out. We're 49 years after this album came out. So you can look back now and say, hey, it was a great album. And who cares that it doesn't sound even a tiny little bit like Deep Purple because it does not sound like Deep Purple. That opening track, Coming Home, has two seconds of John Lord at the beginning, and then he's gone for most of the rest of the album. It's like they start off going, hey guys, everything's gonna be fine, and then he leaves, and it's not fine. And if you look at the credits, Tommy Bolin wrote almost every song on the album, has co-writing credits, most of them were written before he joined the band. They were not Deep Purple songs. They were never intended to be Deep Purple songs. He was not attempting to write in the Deep Purple style. So what you have is a bunch of unconnected music. And for me, it comes off as two thirds of a lesser White Snake album and one third of a decent Glenn Hughes album. I'm a huge Glenn Hughes completist. Uh, I actually bought this album because Glenn is on it. And uh, I do like the songs that Glenn is on best, but the, I don't, again, I agree with, with uh, fellow contrarian Peter Jones, you know, everyone hears what they hear, everyone's entitled to their opinion, but I dislike this album for many of the same things that you guys are, are listing as positives, which is just fascinating to me. I hate Tommy Boland's playing on this album. And it's because if you go back and listen to Spectrum, I completely agree with Butch. Spectrum is mind-blowing. He got a lobotomy when he did Come Taste the Band, apparently. There's not a tenth of the talent that he used on Spectrum on Come Taste the Band. All of his best licks are slide licks. Slide. He plays a ton of slide guitar. Name one other album that in the Deep Purple catalog was slide guitar. Now, Whitesnake... David Coverdale loved slide guitar, and Mick Moody plays slide all over Whitesnake. That was not Deep Purple. Now, you can say, now again, it's 50 years later, so you say, hey, it's it's something different, that's cool. All right, fine, you know what? I actually don't dislike most of the songs, but as a Deep Purple album, I think it's awful. Um, and it's out of touch with hard rock from 1975. Look at the other albums that came out that year. Uh, Alice Cooper's Welcome to My Nightmare. Rush had Fly By Night and Caress of Steel. Kiss came out with Dress to Kill and Alive. Richie Blackmore's Rainbow. Um, Aerosmith Toys in the Attic. No one was doing kind of funk-influenced rock. I, I, I know they liked that, you know, David and uh, Glenn liked that direction, but that was never going to be a popular direction. Uh, even in America, that was a very niche product. So they were tanking the band commercially. And the only person who was really happy with this album at the time was Tommy, because they let him do whatever he wanted. And apparently what he wanted to do was play slide guitar, which I don't understand. Um, his solos are pedestrian. Any regional band 
in 1975 could have produced a guitar player that played as well as Tommy plays on this album. Go back and play Spectrum. He was in the upper echelon of jazz fusion players. Absolutely. And if he had gone in more of a jazz fusion direction, I think that would have fit Deep Purple better. I think as a rock player, Tommy's not really that great. I own Private Eyes and I own Teaser and I don't think they're wonderful albums. They're okay. I don't like them, any of them as well as I like Glenn. I love Glenn Hughes' solo catalog. Uh, and I really, really like um, Getting Tighter and I like You Keep On Moving. Those are great songs. I don't think it's great guitar playing on either of those songs, honestly. Um, but overall, when I listen to this, I cannot get past the fact that when, again, when I buy Coke, I don't want Pepsi. This album is Pepsi. Now, Pepsi is a fine drink if you like Pepsi, but that's not what I thought I was buying. So I give it a four. Wow. Good points, though. Excellent points. Yeah, that's good stuff. All right. I was like, please don't let me be the only negative person on the yeah. panel. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, yeah. Anyway, I, I, I've, I've more than said my piece on that. So let, um, I have not added up the scores, but we've functionally got three tens uh, and three sevens. So that's going to be <laughs> I, an I average did out to an eight and a half. I did what? a four. You yeah, did a you, six, yes. Yeah. yeah, you got a four and a six, so you're probably up just a little over seven with that, right? Seven yeah. and a half? Yeah. So the yeah. contrarians really like this album. Again, I think time has worn the rough edges off of people's perception of this album. Uh, and with the benefit of 50 years of space from it, people like it. They're talking about how it was well critically received and, and all of that. And I think it's much easier to listen to now. If I'd have bought this in 1957, I'd set it on fire and never listen to another Deep Purple album. <laughs> In 57. Uh, did I say 57? 75. I knew there was a five and a seven in there. Time time would have been pretty remarkable in 57. <laughs> yeah. Actually, you know what? All the jazz cats would be like, what? <laughs> so, and jazz cats, for the most part, don't like fusion, ironically. <laughs> that, okay. That's, that's, a, that's a line between, uh, you know, Pat Boone doing Smoke on the Water, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Now, there, there would be a Dark Horse album. We can do Pat Boone's heavy metal album, some, oh. some panel. Yeah. All right, let's go Let's go around one more time and, and see if anybody has any last comments, if anybody wants to take some shots at me before we go. Uh, you will not be alone if we go to the comment section, I guarantee. So, Pontus, any last thoughts to wrap us up here? I, I think I think um, you, can, you can say that Tom heals wounds, but I do think when you listen to... You know, when I go back, because I was, you know, we were told many records you shouldn't listen to. I have the same feeling for this record. I remember seeing this and seeing technical ecstasy in the bins and literally being told, don't listen to those records. They're not good. Listen to this instead or listen to the later stuff. And then you put them on and without that baggage of ha having heard them in 75, they come across as very good albums um, for me. You know, they, 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 I can see the difference, but I can also hear the qualities in them. So, th so that's my point. I, 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 I feel this record is a very good record as it stands. I do think that he plays very well. When I listen to it, I get into the groove. I listen to it. I, I, I really get into his solo. I really like what he's doing. Um, and let's say, yeah. And and again, this was a talented guy, as we said. I mean, he replaced not only Blackmore, he replaced McLaughlin on Spectrum. Spectrum was Billy Cobham's sort of what to do next of leaving Mahavishnu after that band had imploded. Um, he wanted to do a record, so he, he hired a few people. And John John Hammer is on there, and Lee Sklar is on there, and, and all sorts of people. And Tommy Bolin, he picked him up and just played him, he placed him on that record. And, and that says something. Um, and I do think that he 
had he done one more album, we, we don't know what that album would have been. But it was five guys in the group. So, so I mean, Bolin wrote some of the stuff. Uh, and together with Youth and together with Coverdale and some of the stuff he brought in. And they yammed. They yammed a lot. So they, they really got it together before they went into the studio. So I do think still it's a great album. All right. And there's no problem with thinking it's a great album. That's what we're all about, no, right? Individuality. Absolutely. Although, again, let me point out, 1975, Led Zeppelin comes out with Physical Graffiti. Black Sabbath comes out with Sabotage. Deep Purple comes out with Come Taste the Band. One of these things is not as good as there the is other. That's all of, I'm saying. There is a lot of funk on Physical Graffiti. There is a yes, few. But that was Led Trample Zeppelin. Underfoot. And uh, um, what's, what's the opener? Uh, Custom yeah. pie. Uh, Custom, Custom pie. pie yeah. Funky, yeah. 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 So, so, so it was. It was in. It was in the air. You know, if you listen to Frank Zappa from '74, he's very funky. Uh, so that was in the air. Um, around whatever people, you know, if you listen to Relaya, there's a lot of funk in there. So um, I don't know. I would have to re-listen to Relayer. But, yeah, uh, listen to you, sound, listen to Sound Chaser. There are a lot of Zappa fans in the Contrarians. One of these days, maybe we'll do a Zappa panel. Richard, do you I have any last it. comments? Uh, no, I think I've pretty much said all I have to say. You know, I think I'll just file this uh, album away and probably not listen to it. You yeah. know, it just it doesn't really do that much for me. I mean, my six is I think is being generous for me. So okay, yeah, you know, I mean, that's the thing. There is so much music in this world. Why waste time listening to music that you don't like when there's still so much music that you could listen to, explore new things, listen to music you love, whatever. Tate, last comments? Uh, not really. Um, I, I'll maybe expand a little bit on what was said about uh, this album kind of being um, kind of being a preview of what we would see with uh, Coverdale's uh, you know solo albums and eventually White Snake. Um, I, I, I can see definitely the comparison with some of the songs and some of the stuff that you'd hear on like Trouble. I think Trouble probably more than anything um, and the um, the Snake Bite EP too. I'm sorry I didn't mention that earlier, but like um, if I were to pick like a like an album, like a early White Snake album that mm. would probably best represent a continuation of some of the stuff you hear on Come Taste the Band, it would probably be Trouble because Trouble for me is like the very bluesy funky like what car like what coverdale was feeling musically inside and what influences that he was uh absorbing at the time that's kind of the representation of that and then by the time you get to like love hunter you're starting to see um kind of more uh other influences coming in besides besides that not, that's not to say that like trouble is like pedestrian or something like that because it's not it's more Roots, rootsy is kind of the wrong word for it, but kind of um, just very, very ground in the influences, and you get that from um, from Come Taste the Band. So, and I just wanted to throw that out there. All right, Martin, any wrap up comments? No, I'm good. All right, Tim, wrap up comments. Well, I just think this is another one of those albums, and I think I said the same thing about music from the Elder. Um, if I'd been waiting for a new album from this band and this was what came out, would I like it as much as I do now? I don't think so, because it is very different. But going back, like people have said, without the baggage and being a huge fan of Whitesnake, including the early stuff, I, there's a lot to appreciate about this. I can hear, I know what you mean, Reed. It doesn't necessarily sound like Deep Purple, but I like what I'm hearing. Okay, and everyone, I want everyone to understand it's just pure coincidence that Butch went right before me. I am not in any way attacking Butch. I love Butch's opinions. We love talking music. It just so happened that on this album, with the position we went in, he had a very positive view of some things that I had very negative views on. Pure coincidence. Butch, I love you, brother. Wrap up comments. You, uh, I was just thinking that there was a... Tim had me thinking about a, something I wanted to say about it, but there's just a funny story related to, I forget um, who said it, but they were talking about Tommy having trouble playing some of the, the Blackmore era stuff. Um, I was just listening to uh, an interview with Niels Lozauer, 
and he was telling a story about doing a shoot with Deep Purple um, around this time. And he was at uh, SIR studio when the bands were rehearsing and uh, Deep Purple was in one studio and next door, Blackmore with Dio was rehearsing the, the rainbow stuff. And they said, he said what was going on in the in the Deep Purple room was they were trying to show Tommy, teach Tommy the uh, the riff to burn. And they just said he just couldn't, for whatever reason, couldn't get it. Um, which kind of blew my mind because I always pictured him as, you know, to me, like I hear all that material, you hear a guy that can play some of that stuff on Spectrum and play stuff on Mind Transplant and some of the things he does and think that guy can play anything. It's just interesting. It just it must be something about the, um, just little differences in style. But uh, oh, the, the original comment I, I wanted to say was, I, I think it's interesting, the, the idea that coming into this record, you might not like it based on expectations, because I think Stormbringer is a pretty mediocre record overall, other than the title track and one or two other songs. Like, I don't know. It's like, if you like that record, it's pretty funky. So if you like that one, I would think you should like this one. And if you didn't like that one, this one's definitely better than that, as far as I'm concerned. Um, if you came into this record from Burn, then I get it. But this album is way better than Stormbringer. And also, as much as I like who we think we are, like it's better than that record too, overall. The writing and everything. I don't know. That's just me. Those are my final thoughts. Final okay. answer. Okay. Oh, Tate has one. Go ahead. Can I just throw in one last thing here um kind of based on what butch just said except i'm going to approach it from the james gang uh from the james gang um albums that that Bolin appeared on um a lot of, of the stuff like there was one song on there i forget that i had said reminded me of a, of some of the stuff on like um bang in miami um there was one song on the album because tommy Bolin pretty much wrote or co-wrote a lot of the stuff on those two James Gang albums. Great records. And oh, oh, they're fantastic. I love them. those are my two favorite James Gang albums. And um there's a song on the the uh the Bang album called Alexa that is that probably if I were to if if I were to 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 take a guess on like if the style that Bolin took when writing the songs, of course, not knowing that he would join Deep Purple and they'd end up on an album that would come up, that would come out under the name Deep Purple, he's probably reaching into that, uh, that kind of bag for ideas for a song composition. And I'm talking about Alexa on on the Bang album. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to throw that out there. Miami, Miami, I don't really see that that much like i don't think that there are any songs on miami that i can point to and say oh well i think bolin probably used this song as an influence to come up with the stuff that eventually end up on countries the band but for me alexa and maybe one other song on on bang probably stands out in that regard so anyway just all right to and uh butch i'm actually with you on come taste the band being better in stormbringer that's just faint praise coming from me all right i did do the math and it is a 7.6 composite score for this panel so that's still a very very respectable score all right yeah. everyone i hope you've enjoyed this vigorous discussion on come taste the band thank you for watching the video uh the contrarians do have a patreon situation you can check out we're all uh, well, not Martin, because it's his Patreon. But the rest of us are members of the Patreon. Uh, you can vote on topics and participate in these panels. Uh, they have t-shirts. I've already worn my Deep Purple shirt this uh, this week, so I just wore a shirt that was Deep Purple for the video. But the Contrarians do sell t-shirts. You're still selling t-shirts, right, Martin? I haven't I looked so, long. yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, and, you know, all the usual stuff. Thank you for watching. We hope to see you real soon in another video. Everyone, thank right. you for participating. Thanks, guys. See yeah. You. yeah. See you. Yeah. See you. It's fun. See you guys. See you.